Hello again, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Vidalai. Vidalai Rashid Kandajna. I'm a senior research fellow from uh, CELSI, Singapore. Um, so to, in this talk, uh, I'm going to uh, give you a brief introduction um, on CRISPR Cas system, how it works naturally, and uh, you know how this is uh, used uh, in um, you know in uh, in the modern day science, right? Okay, so I want to start with uh, you know this slide where you know you have uh, these two amazing scientists, uh, Emmanuel Carpentier and uh, Jennifer Dub. Uh, uh, Dudna, uh, uh, they are from two different places. One is from Europe, Sweden, and uh, the one is from the USA. So it was a cross collaboration between them that they uh, invented this um, uh, CRISPR-Cas based genome editing uh, tool, right? So this is a small snapshot of their actual paper that was published in Science, the journal Science in 2020, 2012. And uh, you know they have uh, th these this pair of scientists have actually broken a lot of ceilings, right? So one is that you know they are uh, the first pair of female scientists who are uh, receiving a Nobel Prize, and uh, also um, they uh, uh, so this is the fastest Nobel Prize awarded since the invention or discovery, right? So there's, so there is a lot of history here, and it's not just that they have came out of the blue and. Uh, and won the Nobel Prize. So if you look at their profile, and if you look at like, you know, what have they have been doing for a long time, um, and uh, it's it's really amazing. Like, you know, they have been consistently working on uh, important things and uh, uh, being top of their field. And uh, they happen to invent this, which is, uh, which is groundbreaking and uh, very useful, right? Okay, moving on. Um, so this is gonna be the whole, uh, uh, lecture today. One is about the first thing. I'm going to give you some introduction about the genome editing. What are the major tools that are really, uh, uh, the, what are the major tools that we have already? And then about the CRISPR specifically, uh, you know, the timeline and how is it actually uh, happening in the nature? How did we take it as a technology, etc.? And then a bit of a perspective, right? Okay, so coming to genome editing, I want to. Uh, take a minute of yours uh, and give you that minute and uh, just think about why would really we want to edit genomes, right? I'll, I'll, I'll just pause for like 10 seconds for you to, um, you know, think about it. Why would we edit genomes? Just maybe you can list it down or just list it in your head. What are the applications that you can think about? Yeah, I hope you got a few answers at least. So, um, so this this is a typical lecture that I use usually give it to students as well. And um, when when I ask this question, I usually give a form for them to fill it up. And when they filled up the form, so this is what their answers were. So, fifty percent of the students uh, they think that they have um, so the CRISPR technology has an application in diseases, right? And uh, and the next big thing is actually new and improved traits, followed by diagnostic tools. And then the other things are really very, very less, like one or one percentage or something like that. Um, so, so most people think it is actually for, uh, you know, genetic disorders and diseases, right? Uh, but it doesn't stop there, right? You know, the, the CRISPR genome editing, gen, not only CRISPR, genome editing as such has a lot of different uh, applications, right? Of course, we think about gene editing and all that. So of course, yes, you can do that. And then we, we also have the ability to develop new drugs, right? Because we know that there are uh, specific um, proteins or, or drug candidates, if they can be modified to be used uh, in a better way or less side effects and so on that can be produced by um, microorganisms, for example. For example, insulin is being produced by a lot of microorganisms these days, right? So those things can be edited and inserted into microorganisms for them to be able to produce them. And also animal models, these are really important for uh, clinical trials, uh, preclinical trials. We know during this COVID time, there are a lot of clinical trials going on, but before they put anything into the into man, they would actually have to do that in a, 
uh, in animals. And most of the time, of course, animals are very closely uh, related genetically to uh, humans, especially the mice and the and the baboons and and uh, the monkeys. Uh, but then they also want to humanize the animals, as in that you know there are specific mutations that the and uh, the humans have that the animals don't have, and they want to actually incorporate that into the animals so that the the effect that they are studying is very close to what it would happen to a human, right? So for that, people do develop animal models, and then genetic variation. So this is something also important because. Uh, for example, variation here, it is actually showing a lot of different, you know, um, microbes or not the micro cells, different types of cells, right? So variation can be uh, applied to any level, like even to the molecular level as in a protein, right? So you want to produce a protein that has, uh, let's say, a higher activity or something like that. So its uh, active sites should be more specific to something, et cetera. So you can actually create genetic variation and uh, and by that variation, uh, you are going to produce a lot of different types of proteins, and then you screen for a best functional protein, etc. Right? And then materials, for example, uh, there are organisms that can produce shells, right? Uh, and uh, hard, uh, 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 you know, uh, protective layers, etc. So you can basically engineer them to produce a variety of some uh, of these kind of materials, and you can use it uh, for our own for the human good. And food, of course, it is an important part um, where uh, we are, uh, we are, just, we are uh, in 2050, for example, the food expectation, when you calculate the, the amount of food that we have now, or we are producing now, and extrapolate to 2020, 2050, where the population, the whole, overall world's population is going to meet like 11 billion, we don't have enough food for uh, you know all these people so we need to grow food faster we need to grow food that are more concentrated with nutrients etc so we have a lot of challenge there also biofuels of course because we are running out of uh, gasoline and fossil based fuels that are run from uh, that we are taking from underground so we need to produce a lot of fuels as well where we also want to use microorganisms uh, that can produce fuels so there is a lot of application you think about any challenge any biological challenge in on, on Earth, uh, you, you can use genome editing to do uh, to deal with it, right? So there is a lot of application here. Now, so what are the major tools that we have uh, in the in the arena of um, editing genomes? So genome editing is basically you need to actually cut the gene or insert something, right? A gene or the whole genome, right? So basically, we, we call it as nucleases. Nucleases are enzymes that actually recognize the DNA and cut the DNA, right? So that's the only thing they do. So there are, there are called meganucleases. These are really old ones. These were the ones people were using initially to do genome editing. And these are, because they are too big and so on, and also the specificity is not that great, you don't, you, you cannot really especially uh, um, find the location and, and cut the gene, uh, cut the DNA. And then came zinc finger nucleases, which is where, uh, so these zinc fingers, these are sub, um, you know, um, subunits of protein where these are specific to three letter code of the DNA. Let's say you have A, T, G, then it will go bind there. So what you can do is you can actually align, assign tandems of these subunits where you generate a specificity and you can actually attach a nuclease, which is FOC1, which is a normal nuclease. And then, then if you put that based on this sequence that you have assembled with this for, it will detect that sequence and then cut, right? So this is a little more better because you, have, you are able to at least uh, generate um, specificity, right? And then talent. Talents are basically very improved form from here, where this one actually can recognize three nucleotides. This one can recognize one nucleotide. So which means it is more specific, right? So here you, you don't have the control of which three nucleotides you can be uh, working with, but here you can have a control of this. Again, you attach a nuclease, that's called a talent, which is transcription activator like effect on nuclease and then it can cut, and then the CRISPR, right? I will, I'll come to the CRISPR later. 
so so this is how the pro trajectory is and you can see that the feasibility crispr is more easy to do this right so that's the thing and what happens they what are they doing they basically cut the dna that's all right uh, all these nucleases their only job is to cut the dna into two pieces right and then what happens is once the dna is cut then I, be it CRISPR or any nuclease activity, it is not their job next. The next job is actually our cells or the host cell that where it has experienced the cut. What happens is we have systems to repair DNA, right? There are two, basically there are, majorly there are two systems where one is called non-homology and then the other is homology directed. So basically non-homology directed is, uh, it's, it's a little bit of an error prone because what happens is it goes and read the place and then it kind of somehow patches this area. And homology is basically, it look for a same area from another part of the gene or, or the genome and then basically replicate the same thing. A good analogy is like, you know, let's say you have a, you lost a page in a book, right? And then what you do is basically you read the, previous page you, pre you read the next page and then you come up with a content and then write it down and paste it right that is one that's the non-homology based way and the second way is a homology based where what you do is okay you lost a page you go to the library find the same book find the page and then rewrite the whole thing and paste it in your book so that's what is homology they based prepared as so these are the only two things so this is more precise in this case, what you can do is you can do insertions where you know you can direct a template inside. So this is what you want to insert. Then what it happens is okay, the the actually the uh, this is the actual original page it would think, and then it will generate this whole thing, and it will insert the region that you want to insert. So these are the two things. So this happens in the cell. So we don't have any control on that, right? Okay. Now. Um, as I said, non-homology and, and joining, so it has it, it it is error prone because you know it can be many different ways it can you know it can uh, assemble this. Like for example, if you have a area that is uh, uh, you know uh, nickel, I mean this is cut like this, then it would actually um, uh, patch this area. And sometimes if it is not very close to each other, if it is away from each other, it might actually include more things to patch it. And there are also, there are different, uh, different sub uh, uh, pathways where they can actually do this repair thing. So that is why it is a little bit of an error, pro error prone um, pathway, right? And homology repair, as I said, you have a specific template and it reads the template and especially you, you basically do this specific, um, you know, um, insertion or uh, make that small change in the DNA, right? So these are, this is, we don't have control uh, on these two, right? And generally non-homologous is the most, um, um, you know, um, uh, most of the cells uh, are in the uh, are able to do this non-homology because they also are very redundant, etc. Um, and there are some ways people can tweak, like you know, based on the uh, stage of the cell division. Um, some cells are in, you know, highly uh, using the non-homology. Some cells are using, I mean, some stages they are using homology. So you can tweak a little bit, but you don't have a lot of um, uh, uh, yeah, it, 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 as I said, like, you know, you, you can do it, but it's not obvious. So that's what I was, I wanted to say. Okay. So this is how usually people edit genomes, right? So what happens to CRISPR? What is the, what is the major advantage of CRISPR? And I want to show you here that the major difference of the CRISPR compared to the other nucleases is that these are all protein based, right? So you have to send a protein that the protein is actually recognizing the DNA. So it is basically DNA to protein recognition. And this is actually different where there is a nucleic acid that is recognizing this, right? So I'm gonna show you a little bit here before, before going into the details, there's a little bit of a timeline. So this was not discovered in 2012, right? When, when these two amazing scientists actually uh, went together. So this is actually, this was actually discovered in E. coli. It's a bacteria where there has a clustered repeat called CRISPR. They named it there in 1987, right? And then there were a lot of 
uh, organisms, they found that it is present in different bacteria, et cetera, et cetera. And then these guys, what they did was they basically put this together to be able to, uh, uh, you know, uh, do genome editing. So it is an invention. So basically the discovery happened a lot time, long time before, and then it was invented. And then in 2020, as I said, like within eight years, this was awarded the Nobel Prize, All right? Now, what happens in nature? Generally, what is happening? So this CRISPR-Cas system is an immune system for bacteria. So what happens to our immune system? So if let's say if you, if you have a virus or something that comes and infects us, our immune system goes and produce a lot of antibodies. It remembers that and then keep the antibody there. Next time if the same virus comes in, it kicks them out, right? That, that's why we say that, you know, uh, you know, chicken pox and things like that, if you once have it in your life, it will not happen again because you have the memory uh, immunity uh, in your body, right? Also vaccines do the same thing, right? So you, you take a small part of a virus or whatever, it is infecting you, you put it in your body, it will not make you, uh, it, will not, it will not actually be an infection, but then the, the human, uh, the, the immune system recognizes this as a foreign body and then produce a lot of antibody. And once, if the same actual virus comes in, uh, then it will, we will be defended, right? So the same way actually bacteria develops this, uh, this thing where for bacteria, viruses are actually their pathogens, right? So what, how, how a virus infect the bacteria? It will insert its DNA or RNA, and then that goes into the cell and it has the, uh, it has the uh, code for producing the same virus, right? So the host cell, what happens is it will recognize it as its own material, genetic material, and read the code and produces the protein and that protein assembles to form a virus. So basically the virus forms in itself, right? So what happens is some cells, they basically go, this Cas gene, they basically go and bind with the DNA and the Cas is a nucleus. It just basically cuts off the region and then it takes that region and then put it into this repeat spacers. Uh, the spaces are like, you know, it is spaced between uh, the repeats, right? So when, when it put that, then it is present in its genome. Next time when the virus, same virus comes in, the Cas gene actually, because it is already know, it has a region uh, that it can recognize, it can go bind the same DNA, cut the sequence in that same place, and then the viral DNA is no more active. So this is the immune system that uh, is developed by the bacteria, right? Okay, so yeah, so... Uh, this is this is the initial phase where the uh, the thing was recognized and then put it into spacer, right? And then when the new virus, uh, another time the virus comes in, the interference goes because it is producing this, um, from the DNA, it is producing an RNA with this specific region that is present in the virus. Then the Cas9 gene recognizes that region and then cuts there, right? So that's how it happens. Now, um, this is a little bit of a, a you know, extended, version, but the same thing. Um, and you can say, so this is a different organism. This is a different organism. This is E. coli. This is uh, another uh, bacteria uh, that was discovered next to 1993. This was discovered in 1997. And uh, these are the repeat units. This is how it is placed. And these units, basically, they have this kind of a structure where the regions are complementary to each other. That's why it is called repeats. And then they form a hairpin loop right? This loop is the place where um, uh, it is the characteristic of this uh, RNA, the CRISPR RNA. It's called the CRISPR RNA. And this region is the region where it is binding uh, to uh, the specific region of E. coli, for example, right? Uh, for for the uh, specific region of the virus, for example. And then the Cas9 would come here and then cut it, right? Okay. So Cas9, uh, Cas9 is one type of protein, but Cas protein, there are many different way, uh, types of proteins, and there are majorly two classes of nucleases, RNAs3 and then the Cas6. And then Cas9 is part of the type two uh, of the class two, and this is the most characterized one, and it is the most versatile one people are using at the moment. 
but uh, just to show you that there is more uh, here, and this is a this is a plot where it shows that you know how many different types that are out there in the nature, but Cas9 is the one that is most used at the moment. Okay, so the technology. So this is how it works in the nature, but how how the technology works. So basically, what you need is actually there are three things you need, right? One is the CRISPR RNA because this is the guide spacer region, and then this is the uh, uh, so this is the transactivating CRISPR RNA, which is actually having this loop, which is going to bind to this region specific region, right? This is called a, a, a CRISPR RNA trans RNA complex, or you can actually bind these together. So you have one specific region, it's called the sgRNA, right? Uh, sgRNA is basically the trans and CRISPR together, right? Okay. Uh, so PAM is uh, PAM is the region where it is actually uh, uh, it, it's called a protospacer. So this is the spacer region uh, that is recognized, and after the PAM is the region that it has to cut, right? So here is the region, right? So if this is expanded like this, so this is the CRISPR uh, region, and the PAM region is the region where the nucleus recognizes, and three base pairs later it will make a cut. That's the Cas9 job. So the PAM is the region that is the spacer and the blue region is the target region, which was acquired in nature. Basically it was acquired from the virus, but what we can do is we can actually engineer this region, like, you know, whatever sequence you want to cut, basically you, you will actually assign it here, right? So basically you have to make this and then the uh, Cas9 protein. So if you have these two, then you can um, uh, you can actually uh, do the uh, engineering, right? So I'm just going to repeat it one more time. I, I think I wasn't very clear. Um, so you need actually these two, uh, the spacer region. The spacer region is the region where uh, this is the region you want to cut. And here is the PAM region. PAM region is where uh, it is recognizing that next to that PAM region is the region you want to cut. And then you need a tracer RNA, which is basically uh, uh, recognized by the uh, Cas protein, right? Uh, so you need this tracer RNA, sorry, and then the um, the CRISPR RNA, and then the Cas9 protein. So these are the three things you need, and uh, basically two things because if you are linking it with an artificial linker, then it becomes one single sequence, right? So it binds to the region that you want to uh, cut, and then the uh, enzyme recognizes and make a cut here, right? Okay, how you do it in the lab, basically, right? So if you want to do it, how do how would you do it? So first thing is you have to model this in a computer. So there is a, there are a lot of, um, you know, you can just go find CRISPR, uh, CRISPR um, design, CRISPR RNA design tools. There are multiple one, uh, things that are available. And the, mo many of them are, most of them are actually free to use you can actually go uh, design your either uh, the complex or the sgRNA together with the linker uh, for that particular gene and then you basically put this sgRNA and then the cas cas9 producing sequence into a plasmid that's it so you put this one this region you design this one you know the sequence the cas9 sequence you put it into a plasmid and then you just transfect the cells. You infect the cells, the plasmid goes in, and then basically the plasmid is being transcribed by the genome's uh, transcription mechanism, and you get the transcription, uh, sorry, the CRISPR RNA, and it will bind to the cells, and it will make the mutation, right? So because I said, like, you know, there are two mechanisms, right, non-homology and homology. So you're going to generate a lot of different mutations because non-homology is especially error prone. So you're going to make a lot of different cells, you propagate it, and then you have to use other methods like, you know, um, Western blot or QPC, uh, sorry, PCR and these kind of uh, tools to actually select for uh, the 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 cells that you want to actually work with further the the desired mutation right so this is how it, it is done so just one more time so basically you design the uh, CRISPR RNA from the computer and then you make this uh, you you can make this particular uh, single standard 
uh, or double uh, as a DNA, you can actually make the sequence and then put it into a plasmid next to a Cas9 protein transcribing region. And then that plasmid, if you transfect it, that's all you're going to generate the mutants and you screen for the right mutant that you want to use. So this is the technology basically, it's as simple as that. So Cas9, because you know the, the CRISPR, it was uh, basically discovered for genome editing. But then what happened was like, you know, because it is, uh, because the thing is like, you know, it is, uh, as I said before, this is not a protein DNA interaction, right? This is nucleic acid, nucleic acid interaction. And RNA is going to interact with the nucleic acid. So the, the interaction and the specificity is much more uh, precise than the protein to DNA interaction. So that is why CRISPR is being used very widely. That is why it is easy. That is why you can actually uh, edit anything to a one single base pair level. Right, but then because the protein is basically, you can direct the protein to basically bind at a specific region, you can find a lot of different applications. So that's what is shown here, right? This is a normal CRISPR thing. And then you can also do a gene regulation. What happens is that uh, you can actually add a effector next to that protein. So basically what it happens is it, it just goes and bind. Once it is bound there, you can actually activate or deactivate a gene, right? And the same way you can actually modify the epigenetics. Epigenetic modification is basically, there are specific uh, methylation and histone modifications that are present in the genome, which is actually a part of gene regulation also. So if you actually attach an epigenetic modifier with your Cas9 protein, for example, these are called DCAS9, by the way, because DCAS9 is dead Cas9, so it can only bind, but it cannot cut. So that is called DCAS9. So once you deactivated the cutting mechanism, you can attach stuff, then it can go bind there and then do that modification. Also, you can attach you know, specific uh, fluorescent uh, markers, and then you can actually, let's say you want to understand uh, which genes are present in what region of the chromosome, for example, then you can do that with uh, you know, multiple markers, uh, and then they just go and bind there, right? And then you can image it. And then you can also uh, make the structure of the genome. Uh, I mean, you can actually, uh, make, make the, the topology of the genome can be changed. Topology can also um, apply applicable for, uh, not applicable, but it is uh, it has impl implications for how the genes are transcribed, et cetera, uh, right? So you can actually uh, engineer that by actually adding two Cas, DCAS9 again with these regions. Uh, specific regions, and then you attach them with a protein that are complementary to each other, a dimer. So what happens is it will bind to different regions and then pull this together because the proteins are attracted to each other. So you are actually changing the topology, topology of the genome, of the chromatin, right? So, and another one is RNA targeting. Basically what you do is you can actually go um, and uh, not target the DNA, but target the RNA that is transcribed from the DNA. So it can actually also be applicable for gene, gene regulation, et cetera. And then you can base, basically edit a single base, for example, this UGI uh, thing. So it, it actually, uh, if I'm not wrong, this will, this will replace U to T if I'm not wrong. So you can, you can actually do specific base changes uh, using this. One thing you notice that is that the Cas9 is one protein and you basically deleted the, its ability to cut so it becomes DCAS9, but then you can apply this for a lot of things, right? So this is this is why it is very exciting at the moment. Um, so now a little bit of a perspective. So um, CRISPR is a very, very unique thing and, uh, uh, and it's very effective, uh, very easy to use. So everyone is really excited about this. So a lot of news is out there. Uh, same way, a lot of people are working on this and you can see that this is a site where you know they say, they show uh, how much uh, uh, people are actually working on to clinical trials. So these are a list of clinical trials. This is live. No, I just went into the website. Sorry. Um, so give me a second. So this website is actually loading just now. Okay, it's taking time. That's okay. So you, you can actually. Uh, you know, take a look at, okay, it's open now. So you can see that, um, okay, so these are, um, 
different types of uh, diseases or therapeutics that for ca from cancer and everything. Where did it go? I'm really sorry. Yeah, you can see that you know th they are in phase one. Some of them are in phase two, and uh, you know th the list goes on and on and on. Right? It's a really long page. You know, it, it, there's a lot of people working on it, and there is a lot of um, excitement in the field. So I just wanted to capture that for you. Um, so where were we? Here we. Go. Okay. All right. So. At the same time, we need to be a little bit cautious also. So we also saw that, you know, um, there are concerns about the CRISPR uh, being used uh, anywhere. So we need, a, you know, we need regulations to use this technology. Otherwise things can be um, a little bit wrong also, right? Things can go wrong also. For example, any, any you know, for any technology to develop, it, it, it has a like, you know, a uh, couple of decades of science that was that was going on. So it takes uh, it takes a lot of time uh, from a discovery of a phenomenon to be uh, made into an invention or a technology. So it takes a long time. And uh, I generally, when I talk to students, I encourage them to uh, when they are they, when they when they want to be in science, they want to see where they are like if discovery is exciting us or invention is exciting us. So they can go into innovations like industry jobs and things like that. Or if they want to go for academic or you know public scientist and things like that uh, to do discovery, right? So they want to, it's a good idea if they can understand the differences uh, early in their career uh, to choose where they want to end it, right? And the third thing that it has to happen is regulation. Right. If you don't regulate the CRISPR-Cas or any technology for that matter, uh, it can do harm to uh, humans as well as the planet. So this is also some uh, place where uh, many science students don't know that they can work or they can uh, actually uh, build their career on. So uh, these are three different ways you can think. I mean, students can think about their career and. Uh, that's something just I wanted to uh, share with you, and I hope uh, I had I gave a you know brief introduction on how this technology works. And uh, if you have more questions, um, I'll be happy to answer for you. You can visit my website, drwoodward.wordpress.com, and you can contact me there, and I'll be happy to uh, talk to you uh, if if need be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.